Great. My name is Barb Langlo, and I'm um, actually the current president of the um, LA branch of IDA. My, my mind just went blank here on Saturday morning. Um, we're so glad to have you with us today. We Historically, our parent groups meet um, at different parts of LA, um, but this year with COVID, we've been doing them virtually, and it's been nice. Parents don't have to drive in. Um, we have grandparents joining us. I see some, Louise. Good to have you back. Um, so it's just been a delight doing these parent groups um, online this year. So I think next year we'll probably have somewhat of a, of a hybrid of that. Um, Dawn is here. She spoke at our last one. So Dawn, great to see you over there in the corner on my screen. So um, why don't you do this for us? Why don't you go into the chat and just put in your name? Well, I think it can, probably comes up with your name. I, I'm not... I'm, if it doesn't put your name in there and where you're from and how old your kids are and it, and then just put send and it'll just kind of flow on on everybody's screen and we get a sense of who all's here and how old your kids are that you're maybe the kids you're most concerned about if you're like marianne you got tons of kids mm -hmm. so um you can put them all in the names of the ages not the names but the ages of all of them or the ones you're the most concerned about just pop that in um so, um, so I'm with IDALA, the International Dyslexia Association, Los Angeles branch, and that's who you're with today. We're hosting this, and um, I'll tell. And while people are still logging in, I'll just tell you a little bit about us. We're all about getting accurate information out there for parents and teachers. We do a lot of teacher training in the summer on structured literacy. We provide scholarships for teachers to attend half off, and we do grants for schools. And right now we're in the, just the beginning of a grant cycle. So if you're part of a school as a parent or a teacher that needs funding for dyslexia intervention programs, we're all about that. And so if you go to our website, you can see information about funding and how to apply for a grant. And sometimes we have parents writing them for their school because the principal says, I'm too busy, you wanna write it for us? And the parents like, happy to. So um, we give up to $7,500 grants um, for dyslexia intervention programs for schools that can actually go from one to three years. So um, with that money, those funds committed each year. So we're excited about that. We do fundraising for that. If you have funds and you'd love to support us, we're always needing that because we love to give our money away to support teachers and parents. So anyway, that's who we are. And um, we have a big conference every spring not this year, but we will again next year. And um, it's, it's a wonderful event for here in LA, usually UCLA. We bring in big name speakers to talk about dyslexia and intervention and how to support parents and teachers in that. So um, we're excited, Marianne, that you are here today. And I'm gonna have Katie Hickerson introduce her. Katie is a parent in Claremont with three children. Um, they have dyslexia going on in their family, and she's been following Marianne for quite a while. And Katie is one of our volunteers um, with IDA in grants. Is that right, Katie? With the grant? Correct. Yes, in the grant scholarship. Yeah. So we're going to have Katie introduce Marianne. Um, well, so this is Marianne Sutherland, and I didn't really meet Marianne, but I met Marianne online because she has this amazing website called Homeschooling with Dyslexia, and we had pulled our oldest out to homeschool. And I just found this wealth of information um, as far as how to homeschool your kids who have dyslexia. And then everybody all of a sudden was homeschooling their kids with dyslexia, whether you wanted to or not. And so I realized Marianne's site was really applicable to everybody, whether you were homeschooling them through, through Zoom or doing whatever. And Marianne's done a great job as just as far as resources for homeschooling kids. And teaching kids at home with dyslexia but also she does just this amazing job of encouraging parents as far as like your kids um, may have difficulty with reading but they have these incredible strengths that um, that you can build on and um, that just make them beautiful children so um, she does a great job of not only giving parents resources um, for how to work with your kids at home too but also gives them a lot of resources and encouragement of if here's what actually is amazing about your child and how to work with that and incorporate their strengths into their education. So, so I give you Marianne. Yeah. <laughs> that was so nice. I'm like, well, oh. <laughs> you know, when you're a mom of eight kids, you don't hear stuff like that all that often. So that's really nice to hear. Um, well, it's, it's so nice to be able to finally speak at IDA. You know, I, I have gone for years to the conferences and always kind of felt like I didn't fit in because I was homeschooling and it's 
primarily tutors, therapists, teachers, a few parents. And, um, but homeschooling was never really on the radar until now. And um, so it's been a really neat time for me um, with my site, Homeschooling with Dyslexia, meeting a lot of parents who are having a lot of interesting experiences being at home with their kids while they're learning and, and really seeing maybe what they know or what they don't know or what they're capable of or not capable of. And, um, and so I'm really excited to share some practical things. And like you said, Katie, just the encouragement that um, sometimes when we get overwhelmed, it's really important to step way back and look at the big picture. And you'll hear me say that a lot um, for parents. They're your kids and you, you know, we want to focus on the big picture. Like what are, what's our goal here? What's most important to us? And, and all the things that I'm going to say today are also very um personal. So you priorities might be getting into a four-year school. And so your course of action is going to be different than someone who's okay with a community college or allowing their child to do an internship or something like that. So I'm going to try to share my screen and see if this works. Um, I'm not on the right. Hold on one second. Sorry. I'm not super techie. Uh, Oh, here we go. Okay. Let's see if that works. Okay. You guys see that okay? I can't see anybody. Okay. Um, Barb, well, I'll, I'm, sh let's see. All right. I'm going to get started and um, I don't see the chat, but maybe Barb, you'll hop in and just speak to me so I don't have to <laughs> figure that out. So I'm going to be talking about learning at home with dyslexia. Um, my name is Marianne Sunderland, and I'll tell you a little bit more about me in a minute. But I wanted to start by just telling you guys what we're going to go over today. So you can decide, am I staying till the end? Am I going to go to Costco? Or, you know, what am I going to do today? Um, first of all, we're going to talk about some of the things you may be seeing at home. So with dyslexia, uh, I, I don't know how many of you are... Um, already know your kids have dyslexia or think maybe you have dyslexia or your children have dyslexia or, or what your situation is. So we're going to look at some typical signs and we're also going to look at the strengths. As Katie said, I am a huge proponent of the strengths of dyslexia and it's uh, dyslexia has traditionally been defined by its weaknesses just because they were so unexpected to have a child who was bright but struggled to read when their vocabulary was off the charts, right, was, was what made dyslexia stand out. But more and more with research and caring people digging into the, the, what's really going on with dyslexia, we've now found that those very weaknesses that our children have actually cause some unique strengths. And so um, if we can focus on those, you know, we can really draw out uh, their potential, I feel. We're also going to look at some of the myths about dyslexia because nothing stirs up your um, misunderstandings of dyslexia more than sitting across from a child who can't remember how to, how to read the for the hundredth time, right? So we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about some ways to help your child at home. And this is going to be kind of the, I think, why everybody is here, different ways to help our kids as they're learning at home, mindsets, uh, strategies, things like that. Um, some ways to help a discouraged child. And then we'll look at school at home versus homeschooling and um, options if you're feeling like you want to look into homeschooling more. There's a ton of options available for all different types of um, families. Uh, and then I'm going to wrap up with the two most important things to be focusing on. And then we'll have time for Q&A. Okay. So um, if no one stops me, I'm just going to keep rolling. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. Yes, I have eight kids and seven of them are dyslexic. Uh, so yes, dyslexia is genetic, dominant apparently. <laughs> and when my husband and I first started homeschooling like 25 years ago, we did it because we wanted to travel. My husband uh, is British and Australian. And so we did a lot of tra traveling. Um, as you can see by the picture, we're sailors. Um, my husband, who is dyslexic, uh, left, well, when he was uh, 16 in England, he was given the choice to do two years of college prep or two years of an apprenticeship. 
and he went right into the apprenticeship and he did a boat building apprenticeship. And on the southern coast of England, that's a big industry. Uh, came to um, the United States and with his entrepreneurial skills and his training from his internship or apprenticeship, he was able to start a very thriving um, yacht management business. Um, and so we did do some traveling with our kids. We took three years off of school and, or, or not off school, off work. <laughs> we did, we w did what we call world schooling and we sailed for three years um, with our kids. And what, something that was really interesting um, when we went on our trip was number one, our oldest son was 10 and he wasn't reading and we'd had him tested and we're, you know, still kind of lost. We didn't really know what to do. We couldn't afford tutoring. Um, and my husband was like, yeah, you know, I learned to read. He'll be fine. So I was like, oh, okay. You know, so off we went on this trip and while we were gone, we rented our house out to a family friend and their, their kids went to the local public school. And it turned out that their daughter was dyslexic and did not have a good experience. Hers was probably on the lower end of low. You know, I know there's lots of varying um, experiences with public school, but the lesson for me was that they don't know more than I know <laughs> because at least I love my kid, right? And at least I'm looking for the strengths in my kid. And so we decided to continue homeschooling and it's been kind of a roller coaster, you know, with lots of children, lots of learning differences, because as many of you know, dyslexia is not just difficulty with reading. <laughs> it's also difficulty oftentimes with focus and, um, spelling and math and independence, right? And all these different things. And so it was, it was difficult in many ways, but it was also really rewarding. And what, why I love what I do in encouraging families is that now four of my kids are graduated. So this picture on the screen is kind of, needs an update, but um, I have four adult kids now, all of them are dyslexic and all of them are uniquely successful based on who they have always been. And I, so I have a unique perspective to be able to look back and see what worked, what didn't work, what was important and what wasn't important. And that's what I like to share. Um, one of the neat things that we did for those of you, there weren't a ton of high schoolers that I noticed in the chat, a lot of third, fourth grade and around elementary age, but um, our two oldest kids, uh, Zach and Abby, took their junior years off of high school and both of them uh, at different times took these amazing sailing trips where Zach sailed around the world by himself. Um, he stopped 14 times, 13 times. He stopped a bunch of times. Then my husband would fly out and um, help him fix his boat. And anyway, and this was all because while we were traveling, we were reading books of world explorers, right? You know, and so he was like, at 16, he was kind of getting in trouble and we were just like, dude, you know, you need to find something to do with your life. And anyway, it's a long story. It's a completely different uh, talk, but I just want to let you know that our kids are amazingly capable, sometimes different than us, especially if you're not dyslexic um, and homeschooling, it can work. Um, even though we may not uh, feel like we're checking off all the boxes. Okay, so I think that's enough for my story. If you guys have any questions about our travel or um, any of that kind of stuff, we can um, talk about that at the end. So let's look, first of all, at some signs that you may be seeing in your young kids with dyslexia. Um, so, uh, um, sorry, I'm trying to, to frame this, but let's just, I'll just read through the list real quick. So learning to talk at a later age than other kids. Um, difficulty learning the names of shapes and colors, difficulty learning letter names and sounds, reversals of syllables like baschetti and um, things like that uh, within a word, unable to recognize or produce rhymes is a big one. Um, some kids stutter as young children. Most kids with dyslexia at young ages will have trouble memorizing like the days of the week, the months of the year, the alphabet numbers. They may have trouble recognizing letters and words even in their names, and they may have delays with fine motor skills like tying their shoes, coloring, or writing. And so while it's not common to diagnose children who are young, and please stop me, somebody, if you know more than me, um, I know that they can be um, tested and diagnosed at a young age. And if you have other children with dyslexia, then there's a pretty good chance 
um, that your younger children may also have dyslexia. But these are some things that you may be seeing. And so, again, when I share these things with you, um, remember, these things are normal. Will they ever learn shapes and colors? Yes, they will. <laughs> will they ever, you know, learn to pr produce rhymes? Yes, they will. But they will struggle with it when they're younger. So these are just some signs. It's nothing to panic about. All right. So when your children are, a lot of you have children in elementary school. So things that you might be seeing are that your kids love a good story. Oh boy, mom, read me a story. Mom, read me a story, right? Dad, can you read this? Um, but when you ask them to sit down and read, not so much, right? They really dislike um, the act of reading. Why? Because it's really hard for them. Um, and that's normal. Um, they, because they have slow and inaccurate reading, um, they'll use context clues rather than sounding words out. They often can skip or misread little words like at, to, and of. Um, we'll always have poor spelling. It'll be very phonetic. Um, trouble telling time on a clock with hands. A lot of our kids will have difficulty getting words out of their mouth. Um, I remember my son, when he was little, trying to explain to me a vegetable. And he was like, you know, it's, it's green and it looks like a tree. And I was like, broccoli? And he's like, yeah, broccoli. So they just, it's like this processing of language, right? It's just a little slower. Um, inattentiveness and distractibility. From my research, I see that 40 to 60% of kids with dyslexia will also have some sort of attention deficit or executive function weakness. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, they may have slow or messy handwriting, also called dysgraphia, letter and number reversals after first grade, uh, trouble memorizing math facts is a big one. And we can talk about some strategies for that later if you guys are having issues with that. Um, and hesitant speech, uh, difficulty finding the right word, kind of like the last example that I gave. And so again, these are some things that you may be seeing with your, your child and they are warning signs. It's like, okay, you know, maybe my child has dyslexia because they're exhibiting these signs. Um, and so um, we'll talk about what to do about that information, but I, I wanted to share these things because I think it's so important to understand, you know, cause I'll, I'll get a lot of parents talking to me, emailing me and saying, well, they reverse letters, but they can kind of you know, they're, they're just not sure because they are doing other things so well. And, I, and so when you see a list like this, it really helps you to realize that dyslexia does affect a lot of different areas. Uh, and so the last signs of dyslexia we're going to look at are just through adolescence and adulthood. Um, this difficulty processing auditory information is a big one. Um, all of our kids will have that, but it's more pronounced, I suppose, with our older kids and adults because they are expected to be able to process auditory information faster. Um, so this can be a huge issue if you're attending lectures, right, and you're listening to people talk um, because it, your ears may be, have perfect hearing, but the processing of that information is just slower. That's all it is. It's just slower. It doesn't take the direct path like um, traditionally wired brains do, and so it takes longer. Um, poor uh, organizational skills, uh, losing their possessions, this is also referred to as executive function. Um, they may still read slowly or have poor comprehension. Uh, they may have difficulty remembering the names of people and places, difficulty organizing their ideas to write a paper, difficulty reading music, difficulty with foreign languages, uh, inability to recall numbers in the proper sequence. Um, my accountant is dyslexic. Isn't that interesting? So <laughs> she's often kind of switching things around, but so far so good. I mean, she's brilliant uh, in every other way. Um, lowered self-esteem due to past frustration, frustrations and failure. And if you guys have kids like that, I have a lot of ideas for that. So please feel free to ask in the questions uh, chat box for later. Um, because there are ways to um, help our kids with this. And uh, some kids um, may end up dropping out of school. Um, I, I am assuming that because you're here, your children will not be one of those kids because um, the, they've done research and asked successful dyslexics, you know, what was the main thing? What was the thing that made the biggest difference in your success? And across the board, the most commonly referred to thing was the presence of a caring adult. Or it could be a teacher, it could be a parent, 
uh, somebody who said, I see you, I, I see that you have potential and I'm gonna help you get where you need to go. Those kids aren't dropping out of school. Those kids are maybe struggling, but they're gonna be okay. All right, so let's look at the strengths of dyslexia. As I said before, and I don't know if any of you have read the, um, is it AIDS, uh, Fernet and Brock AIDS or EDs, um, they wrote a book called The Dyslexic Advantage and they did uh, research with successful dyslexics and they determined that this is where, they were looking at brain structure. These were the, these were the people that determined that the, the different brain structure that dyslexic people have actually creates strengths, okay? And so our kids and, and our spouses or even we, if we're dyslexic, are often highly creative. And that doesn't mean necessarily like they, they're into art or music or the traditional arts, um, but it could be just a different way of seeing the world. Um, they have a, an ability to make connections that other people like two-dimensional thinkers um, aren't able to make. And so it's, if you sit and listen to your kids, they'll often, like I speak at homeschool conferences and I used to, I always bring a kid with me or sometimes the whole family will come. And one of my kids would come, I would always get lost. Like I couldn't find my way around, you know, and by the time we left, I could kind of tell my way around, but he, he would get in there and he'd be like, you know, they shouldn't have the, the booth here, the registration booth. They should be over there. And this, there's not a flow. And he, he would like kind of reorganize the whole room in his head. And I don't know, you, you'll see neat things like that, that your kids can do. Um, they're also often entrepreneurial. My husband's very entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial and my two adult sons are as well. Um, many uh, people with dyslexia have extreme persistence, right? They, they are not... Um, they're, they're, they know that they're smart, they know that they have abilities, and they persist in um, working hard. Um, I also mentioned that um, the kind of the connectivity or the seeing of patterns in the world and similarities and connections that other people don't see. Um, they tend to have a holistic way of seeing things. They see the big picture at, they, um, without getting lost in the details, right? So while they can't, um, you know, focus on details or spelling or math facts or whatever, um, the big picture uh, is, is their strength. Um, they often have excellent comprehension of stories read or told to them, strong reasoning skills, ability to understand abstract ideas, and an inclination to think outside the box, which in my family is kind of an understatement. But um, these are the strengths of dyslexia. And, and as our kids grow, we want to be... Um, nurturing and fostering these strengths in them because in the end it's going to be where they thrive in the world if they're working with their strengths. All right, let's look at a few myths and then we'll get on to some ideas for how to support our kids with learning at home. Um, the first myth, um, which you may not believe people think this, but there are people who think dyslexia doesn't exist and that's just, it's, it's kind of, it's a myth because they just haven't looked into it, right? But dyslexia is actually the most researched learning issue across the board. Like there's so much research being done on dyslexia. So it absolutely does exist. Um, the second one, which I'm sure we've all experienced is that people with reading problems or dyslexia are lacking in intelligence. And of course that's not true. In fact, uh, diagnosis or um, determining if a person was dyslexic uh, used to be because they had high, they would say, well, their intelligence is fine, right? So uh, there's no reason for them to not be able to read. Um, and still today, if you have psychoeducational testing done on your child, they're going to test uh, their IQ to make sure that that's not a factor. So dyslexia is not a lack of intelligence, far from it. Um, another myth is that children will outgrow dyslexia, like, oh, well, they've learned to read, so they're fine. And that's, that's not really true. I mean, they are fine, but they're not, they're still going to have directionality issues, uh, memory issues, processing issues. They'll learn to deal with them. Um, you know, they'll marry someone who's not dyslexic, or they will um, use assistive technology and things like that, but they will always be dyslexic. Um, another myth that I was the brunt of when I was, uh, my kids were younger, was that dyslexia is caused by bad diet, bad parenting, or too much screen time. And that's simply not true. Oh, my cats are fighting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, none of those things are going to help our kids, 
but they don't cause dyslexia. Another myth is that dyslexia is a visual problem. That is not true. It's a processing problem. When, my, when I was first starting out on my dyslexia journey, vision therapy was hitting the scene. And uh, you know, someone would come to our homeschool group and screen all the kids and they all needed vision therapy, right? Um, now, the vision therapists, to their credit, have made it very clear now that, that vision therapy won't help with dyslexia. It will help with tracking issues, but it won't help with dyslexia. Your child will still have dyslexia. Um, another myth that um, you may be experiencing at home right now is that your kids with dyslexia just need to try harder. Like, why can't you remember that? Just try, right? And the sad thing about this myth is that they are trying. <laughs> they really are. In fact, they're trying harder than all the other kids in their class who are traditional learners. And so we really need to approach our kids with compassion, knowing that it is very hard for them. Um, and lastly, the last myth is that accommodations for dyslexia are a crutch and unfair to others. So we'll talk a little more about accommodations in a bit, but essentially accommodations are tools or strategies that help our kids to continue learning at their intellectual ability, despite the fact that their reading, writing, and spelling is not at their intellectual ability. So an example of this would be uh, for their social studies or literature, they would listen to their book instead of reading it. Um, their brains are perfectly capable of understanding the material, but if they had to decode every word in the book, they would hate the class, they wouldn't understand, you know, you would have fights every night, right? And so we want to provide our children accommodations. They are not unfair to other students. It's leveling the playing field. And so if you have more questions about that, we can talk about that too at the end. All right, so I hope you guys are sticking with me here. Um, we're gonna move into how to support our kids with dyslexia at home. Um, for, I touched on this a little bit before that we wanna offer them compassionate support. Um, dyslexia makes learning hard, especially in the younger years. And as, if we're so focused on getting an assignment done or keeping up, um, we're gonna stress ourselves out and we're going to stress our kids out. Um, if you've never taken a dyslexia simulation, you have to find a way to do that. And Barb, I don't know if you guys have ever done that. I know the Dyslexia Training Institute where I did my OG training, they offer, yes. you have? Yeah, we do them. And if people are interested, you could let Christine know at our office and we actually do them virtually too. Yeah, so, I just. Yeah, that's a big part of what we do. We'd love uh, to do that. Yeah. yeah, okay. I would love to, to, uh, to point people to one of those because when you understand really how difficult it is for our kids to read and write and spell, uh, it changes your whole attitude towards them. From one of pushing and frustration to one of kindness and compassion, and that's what they need. Um, so on a more practical note, um, one of the things that helps me keep going with a house full of dyslexic kids is creating lists. Um, and so this might be for your school at home, you know, how to log on, when to log on. Um, a mom I was just talking to had dry erase boards for each of her kids and she, with like the magnet, you know, and they would just move the magnet down, especially if you're working at home and you can't always be with your kids. Um, creating, um, tools for them to follow so that they know what they're supposed to be doing and when they're supposed to be doing it. And also creating a list of downtime expectations. Now, I don't know uh, personally how everybody's schools are handling. I think all the schools are different. So some schools, the children are actually sitting down doing Zoom or whatever, you know, maybe five, six hours a day. Whereas some schools are only doing a few hours a day and then the kids are learning at home. Um, but whatever the case is, um, having some clear expectations about what can be done during downtime. You know, I know that if I don't tell my kids when mom's on a meeting you, and you're done, don't pick up your iPad. You know, if I don't tell them that, that's the first thing they're going to do. They're going to go build a Minecraft world, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I like to reserve that for later in the day um, because the beauty of being bored and having nothing to do is that their brilliant minds will think of something to do. And if their kids, if your kids come to you and they're like, mom, I'm bored. I have nothing to do. This is what I tell them. I go, that is so exciting. 
because you're about to think of something amazing to do. And they grumble and walk away and they almost always do. So um, not to, we don't want to worry about our kids being bored, but we do want to set some expectations for what they're allowed to do when they're bored. And may I recommend you don't tell them to go read a book like I used to do all the time. <laughs> tell them to go listen to a book, but don't tell them to go read a book. Um, and so I know for a lot of us, um, the struggle with online learning or learning at home or really anything with our kids that involves language is their lack of independence. Um, and so, especially with younger kids, you know, are these younger kids learning to log on and find their classrooms and find the assignments and upload and download, right? Um, so a, a strategy that I have used to help teach my kids things that help them to become independent is the I do, we do, you do strategy. I don't know if you guys have heard of this before, but um, so say, let's use the example of like cleaning the kitchen. So, or, or cl cleaning a bedroom is a good one, but let's do the kitchen. Um, so Initially, when I'm teaching one of my kids how to clean the kitchen, because if your kids aren't cleaning the kitchen, they should be. <laughs> give yourself a break and just give them those chores. That'll keep them busy. Um, but initially, I would just have them watch me. This is how I do the kitchen. This I clean the counters. I put the food away. You know, I load up the sink. I rinse off the dishes. I load up the dishwasher, whatever, whatever, right? So I, I show them what I'm going to do. And then, then once I've showed them, um, we would do it together. So, okay, let's wipe, you wipe that counter, I'm gonna wipe this counter. Um, you grab that food, I'll grab this food, right? And we're working on this, the job together um, where you can watch them doing it and give them a little correction, but they're not overwhelmed because they have to do the whole thing. And then eventually you'll switch to you do where they're gonna do it themselves and you're just gonna oversee and make sure that they figure it out or that they're able to figure it out. And so this strategy, um, you know, our kids, our kids are not intuitive learners in certain ways, like especially for cleaning the kitchen or cleaning their rooms or things like that, um, or reading. Um, they, they often need to be taught explicitly how to do a lot of things. So um, this is a great way to do anything, you know, to, to help them clean their backpacks, to help them organize their schoolwork, to help them organize or do anything really, is that you just model for them what to do. Um, and that's been really, really helpful for helping me to get my kids a little more independent. Um, the next way that you can support your kids with dyslexia at home is by communicating with teachers and administrators. And I, I mean, obviously, right? But um, you are your child's advocate until they can advocate for themselves. And the number one priority for families right now during all this stuff that's going on is not getting assignments done. It's our kids, you know, how are they doing? Are they feeling stressed? Are they feeling depressed? Are they overwhelmed? You know, um, we want to focus on those things first, right? That they, um, I, I don't want to blow your minds or anything, but I've been reading some research on math lately. And there's a researcher whose name I can't remember at the moment, but he was saying how children can learn all of the math that you learn in K through six in about 20 hours once they're like, you know, they're ready, like middle school age, you know, so they'll learn. <laughs> you don't need to worry about their learning as much as you need to learn about what are they, what are they really learning about themselves and about the world and about their family. Um, so communicating with teachers and administrators as humbly and kindly as possible, right? They are, they are maxed out too. They are dealing with all kinds of new things, um, blame and shame and all that kind of stuff. There's no place for that. Um, well, maybe there is, but, but rarely. Okay. And so I really encourage you to communicate with um, teachers and administrators in an um, understanding way. Um, use accommodations. I don't know, you know, if your children don't have a 504 plan, what the school would say, but I would use accommodations if I were you. Um, that could be uh, them scribing. Um, I know for some of my kids with attention issues, doing, um, long division was brutal. You know, it was just brutal. They didn't remember their math facts and then it was all the steps. And then it was just like, it was just brutal. And so, um, sometimes when I was just like, let's just finish the assignment, I would say, just tell me what to do and I'll write it. Um, and so he was able to focus his, his, um, minuscule working memory on just one thing or two things at a time, instead of all the things, um, let your kids listen to books. 
right? Let them use speech to text, give them more time. Um, you are, I, I'm assuming that you're allowed to do that. I mean, maybe not on tests. I don't know how that works, but I would strongly recommend using accommodations. And if you um, need a list of more accommodations, you can Google them, or I have a list on my website that you can um, look for, but there's, um, those are the main ones really. Um, also, I know that Barb and everybody at IDA can help you guys request remediation from the school. This would be testing or an IEP, uh, but you can also remediate at home. Um, there are a lot of programs that are excellent for parents to use at home. You do not need to be trained in Orton-Gillingham to be able to use them. This is your Barton. You're all about reading. Um, Logic of English, uh, Reading Horizons has a really good online Orton Gillingham program that we use for our older kids. Uh, I have links for all this stuff too, so I can put them in the chat later. Um, I have a post that kind of, um, it compares those top four Orton Gillingham programs. So you could do that at home um, and not, or hire a tutor yourself. I, I um, don't have the, um, benefit of the school to help me with my kids remediation and um, so we do do it ourselves but um, you can too you don't have to wait um, and lastly um, keeping your eye on the big picture as I said like if your child is melting down over writing a book report um, stop for a minute and just scroll back you know and what is the what is the point of this assignment you know is the point of this assignment that he write a paragraph is it that he shows that he read the book? Is it to show that she understood the story? What is the point of the assignment? And focus on that. If they need accommodations um, for, uh, you know, to, to show that they know what they were supposed to know, then allow that. And um, that you're prioritizing your child's well being over the assignment. Um, now, I know um, that a lot of kids with dyslexia who are in school struggle with discouragement. And I uh, stumbled upon an idea several years ago about mindsets. I don't know if you guys have read Carol Dweck's book called Mindsets. Um, it's a great quick read, a fascinating story how she did this research with um, students. She was, she was studying learned helplessness and then she kind of um, morphed into this idea of how um, a child's school experience would affect their attitude. And so the research that she did with these poor middle schoolers, <laughs> she took three groups um, of kids and the first group, they, they gave them some kind of, I think it was math. There was math problems that they gave them. And the first group, um, when they were finished, they were praised for their intelligence. So it would go like this, like, wow, you did really good on that assignment. You must be really smart. And then the next group, um, they praised for their process. So that would look like, hey, you did really good on that, on that um, challenge. Um, you must have worked really hard on that. And then the last group was just kind of neutral praise, like, hey, good job. Okay. So then they took these kids and they offered them an option of what they were going to do on their next, next task. And what they found was that the kids who were praised for their intelligence chose an easier task. And the kids who were praised for their uh, work effort or the effort that they put in um, chose a harder task. And so this is really the Reader's Digest version. And I highly recommend reading the book if you ever get a chance. It's, it's fascinating. But basically, the, um, the conclusion of that uh, research was that both groups of kids were sensitive to what the researchers valued, whether it was their effort or their intelligence, and they were motivated to continue to perform well in those ways. So what does that mean <laughs> for us? What that means for us is that we want to start praising our kids or encouraging our kids for what, for, for the work that they're putting in, acknowledging the fact that they gave it their best effort because our kids will then be inspired to continue putting in their best effort because it's being recognized, okay? So here are some signs of a fixed mindset. So a fixed mindset, so there's two kinds of mindset. There's fixed and there's growth. 
Um, we want our kids to have a growth mindset. So a fixed mindset is the belief that intelligence is fixed. Any subject that's difficult or requires much effort simply means that you're not very smart. Okay, so the things that you might be seeing in your kids who have a fixed mindset is that they only care about looking smart. They don't want to take a risk of looking dumb. Um, and so some, some kids will take it to the extreme of even lying or cheating because they don't want to look dumb. They will avoid academic or other challenges. Um, and they, they, they feel that learning should come easy. And if they apply too much effort, um, then they're just not good at it. You know, I'm not a math person, right? Because I'm struggling with math. Well, that's not true. Um, because research has shown that our brains are uh, able to change. We, you know, I'm sure you guys have talked about neuroplasticity in your group. Um, um, that our brains can change and can grow. And that's part of what makes up a growth mindset. And that is the belief that intelligence can be grown and that subjects that are difficult or require extra effort mean you are increasing your intelligence. Um, and so kids with a growth mindset aren't afraid to work hard. They understand that learning takes practice and that even geniuses have had to work hard for their discoveries. And they understand that hard work and practice make you smarter. Um, now, I, I, the, so the, the $64 million question is, well, how do you teach this? And I, I didn't include that in my talk, but I do have um, a detailed post on my site, which I can link to later on how to actually teach your kids about growth mindset. And that starts with teaching them about their brains and neurons and how, um, how they can grow and, and increase. Um, and so there's a little video, you don't have to like understand neuro, neuro, neurology to be able to teach it. There's a cute little YouTube video on that post, but um, working with our kids to um, encourage a growth mindset is going to help them throughout their entire lives. Uh, Thomas Edison was famous. You know, he was dyslexic, they believe. Uh, he said, I'm not discouraged because every wrong attempt discarded is another step forward. Uh, if you're looking for a good read aloud, there's a landmark version of uh, or it's a landmark biography of Thomas Edison that kind of details his life and the struggles that he had. And it by far has been one of our boys' favorite um, biography. They just loved, loved, loved this story. Well, I say my boys because my husband, <laughs> I think it's his favorite read aloud. Um, another way that we can help our kids who are discouraged about their learning is to use this word yet. Now, I don't know if you guys have heard this, um, but it's really, really simple. It's, you know, I can't read this book yet. I can't understand this math yet. Right. And, and this kind of, um, reframing of their learning, it's not an overnight kind of thing. It takes time. Um, but it's a fabulous way to help them to not get stuck in a rut of where they are now and why, and that they're not doing well now. Um, shoot, I was going to say something else. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm going to link to that post because, oh, I know what I was going to say, because there's a lot of good ideas in there, but there's another website and I don't know if I'm allowed to do this. Um, I'm not associated with them or anything, but um, this, the site is called Big Life Journal and they specialize in uh, growth mindset for kids. And they have, if you sign up for their newsletter, every Friday, they send out a free uh, growth mindset activity. And so we just, I print them up every Friday and we get them done during the next week. Um, teaching a growth mindset, teaching kids to be positive about their learning, to be positive about themselves, uh, takes, a, takes some time, especially if they're in deep in a rut of discouragement. But it's a fabulous way to nurture that kind of positivity in our kids. All right, a couple other things for helping discourage child children. Um, teach your kids about dyslexia. I, I'm assuming that IDA is big on that, but there is, there is you know, a, a large body of people who don't want their kids to be labeled, right? They don't want them to have um, a reason not to work hard. They don't want them to uh, feel bad about themselves or whatever, but they're going to feel bad about themselves if they're not able to keep up with 80% of the kids in class. And so we want to teach them what dyslexia is. 
you're smart. You just have trouble with these things, right? And then, hey, why don't we teach them about the strengths as well, right? Um, I have a children's book called What is Dyslexia? You know, teaching a kid about dyslexia. But there, but it it's focuses, but you may be feeling this, but these are the strengths that you can feel too. And so funny thing, you know, I have eight kids, seven with dyslexia. My one non-dyslexic kid used to kind of whine, like, I want to be dyslexic, you know, because we were really kind of trying to pump up the kids who were dyslexic, you know, well, this kid is fabulous with animals or this kid can cook like no one's business, you know, or this one can light a fire or, or whatever, or, or navigate through a forest, right? And you know, and she was really good at reading and spelling. <laughs> so she was, she wanted to be dyslexic because there's so many strengths associated with it. So it's important to help them to understand themselves. The, um, oh gosh, maybe you remember the name of this place, Barbara, they're in Pasadena. They did a longitudinal study of um, uh, successful dyslexics. And um, I think it was Frostig School, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I see um, and a fabulous study. Oh my gosh. It was, it was just like Christmas when I found that because, you know, it's like dyslexia research. Ooh. But um, basically what they found is these, they, they found six traits in successful dyslexics. Um, one of them was understanding their strengths and weaknesses. Another one of them was knowing when to ask for help and who to, who to get it from. Um, so these are, this is all part of building up our kids' success. Did you know that there's not one um, success attribute in that whole study about academics or IQ? Not one. They all have to do with a child's level of self-knowledge, uh, support, uh, resilience, those kinds of things, okay? So we can teach that at home and it's free. Um, and then I highly recommend grabbing that, or actually I have a post I wrote on it too. I could link to that if you guys are interested. Um, so we want to advocate for them. Here's another way. And we want to teach them to advocate for themselves, right? We don't want our kids um, hiding behind a post because they're not able to keep up, right? We want to help them to have a healthy amount of I don't know what's the word I'm thinking of, confidence enough to say, like they understand their strengths and weaknesses, they understand what's appropriate, and they're able to go to teachers or administrators if necessary and, and get express their needs. Um, and so that starts with us. We can do that for them until they're able to do it themselves. Um, if, you're, if you have a child who's really discouraged or really struggling, I talk to a lot of parents like that because they're they're like, I would rather go to hell in a handbasket than homeschool my kids, but they're like, I have to homeschool my kids, right? So um, if you're in that situation, um, a time of de-schooling can be really, really effective. Um, and summer is a great time to do that. And maybe you guys already do that, but um, homeschooling really does allow you to decompress. A lot of kids who are overwhelmed with anxiety, depression, what have you, from their school stress, um, recover fairly quickly by a period of de-schooling. And, and basically what that is, is just taking a break from formal academics for a period of time. And I know that flies in the face of all common sense. Like why on earth would you ever do that, <laughs> right? They're behind, you know, why we can't take a break. Um, but the reality is, is that kids who are stressed can't learn. You know, there's lots of research that shows that um, we, we're, our, our our, when our brain is in limbic mode, you know, fight or flight, the prefrontal, they are, our thinking brains are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so we need to get that, their bodies calm. We need to get them feeling safe. And a lot of times with de-schooling, what we recommend is pursuing their interests. So, you know, if it's animals, you're going to the zoo, you're going for hikes, you're going to the, um, the uh, what's the aquarium? <laughs> you know, you're doing things that that are interesting to them and kind of rekindling their love of learning. Um, so that can be a time, um, a period of time that you could do that with your kids. Um, and I have um, a PDF and a post that I can share with you kind of walking through what it would look like to get started with homeschooling. If that was something that you were considering in any way. Um, and then 
if you ha- we talked a little bit about boredom already, but boredom is good, guys. You know, I mean, kids today are so distracted. Oh, okay, moms too. We're so distracted by all the bells and trinkets. You know, we got our phones and our iPads and we got all the social media and, you know, there's so much good, fun stuff out there um, that we're rarely bored. But when kids are bored or there's no cookies in the house, you know, they'll, they'll bake some. Um, they'll build a fort. They will um, look at how to build a website. You know, there's, if we allow our kids downtime, um, that's okay. And we talked about that before, so I won't belabor it, but um, remind them that they're about to find something amazing to do. Okay, so I wanted to um, just touch a little bit on school at home versus homeschooling, just to give you, a, if you're confused about what that means. I know there's been a lot of talk about it, you know, earlier on in the COVID um, virtual schooling kind of scene, but school at home is not the same as homeschooling. And the major difference really is that in homeschooling, you control your schedule. So, and you control your curriculum in large part, Uh, whether you're in a public school charter school who will be your covering and you'll submit work to them once a month, or you are homeschooling independently or through some kind of homeschooling group, you have a lot more freedom. Um, and, and why it works so well for kids with dyslexia, especially younger kids. Well, really, well, I'll talk about for younger kids first, and then I'll talk about for older kids. The reason why this kind of freedom is so good for younger kids with dyslexia is that our kids just take a long time to master the basics. So I noticed that a lot of you have kids like are in third grade, they're nine, eight, nine, ten, 10. Um, and that's when you're starting to get stressed out, right? You're like, dang, you know, they're still not reading very well and they're still really struggling. Well, guess what? That is a hundred percent normal for kids with dyslexia. Kids with dyslexia take a lot longer to master those kinds of learning. And so Being at home really allows that to be more seamless. Um, So some schools do a great job with that and some not so good. And so if you're having trouble with that kind of um, pacing or your child's, maybe, you know, because kids can be more profoundly dyslexic, um, then homeschooling is a nice option because you can relax and you can go at their own pace. Um, And you can individualize their learning without getting permission. (laughs) So you don't need testing. You don't need an IEP or a 504 plan. You can just go in and teach them with a curriculum that that you like um, and teach them, you know, if you're having a bad day, do you ever notice that your kids some days just nothing will go in? Nothing. And so you can just say, you know, we're going to go for a hike today um, or we're going to go on an adventure today. And it's, it's, they're not having to experience those, those real low points of frustration with themselves and their learning. Um, it also allows a lot of time to focus on interests. Um, and this has been something that I've learned the hard way. You know, when my kids were younger, I had all these kids, you know, and they my older kids weren't reading. So I spent a lot of time helping them learn, learning to read and do their math. And um, so my kids just played a lot. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, they're just going to, they're never going to go anywhere in life because all they do is play. Uh, turns out that play is actually a really good thing for our kids to do. And it kind of helps them to hone in on their interests, you know, having that downtime and, uh, um, you know, we want to facilitate those interests and then they can really become something wonderful. One of my kids, so into animals, she loved, loved, loved animals. And, um, so she wanted a rabbit. So we got a rabbit and she joined 4-H and then she wanted to breed her rabbit. Thanks, 4-H. And so after a while, we got a couple more bunnies and she bred them and, and she would keep track of, you know, when they were bred and when they were going to kindle. And then she would keep track of their, um, their records, you know, because they were, um, I forget what the word is called, but they have, you know, paperwork and she would sell them and then she'd go to the fair, you know, and, and she ended up buying a horse with the money. I mean, it was an old horse. <laughs> But you bought a horse with the money that she earned from all of this, from, from, um, from raising her animals. And it's funny because I tell this story, but my, when I was 12, I went to my dad and I was like, I'd been to horse camp a couple summers, you know, and I was like, dad, I really want to own a horse, you know, I'd been to horse camp and I really like it. And 
I'll never forget. My dad was a great guy, but he looked me right in the eye and he said, you will never own a horse. <laughs> that was not part of his plan, right? But when my daughter came to us at about 12 or 13 and said, I want to buy a horse, my dyslexic creative husband, because I was going to say, you will never own a horse, but he turned around to her and he said, well, how would you pay for it? And so, you know, she went off and did her research and calculated how much she'd saved by selling her animals and how much it cost to get a neighborhood horse, you know, one horse that we could go in the backyard, bought a horse. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of time and freedom for focusing on things like that. Um, obviously, homeschooling um, does give your child more freedom from being you know, measured against their peers that are traditional learners. You, you may have some siblings that are traditional learners, but it's not quite the same kind of stress. Um, it allows your kids to work at their pace and it avoids that rigid scheduling and teaching to the test that can be really frustrating for our kids who always want to know why, right? They want to know why. They want to dig deep into things. And with homeschooling, you can do that. So I don't want to talk too much about homeschooling because I, I'm, that's not really why I'm here. But I did want to touch on that, that there are a lot of benefits to homeschooling. And it's, it's um, contrary to what I used to think, it's really not that hard. Um, in fact, I love this quote from Deborah Bell. I think it sums up um, homeschooling. You know, a lot of parents think I could never do that. But the reality is, is good teachers are motivated teachers and good teachers are self-educating. The parents I hang around with are both. Um, so you're here, you're getting educated, you're motivated, and that's really all it takes to be a good teacher to your kids. All right, we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to tell you my two, um, my two things that are the most important thing for parents to do when they're teaching their kids at home. And number one is parent education. Um, being educated about dyslexia is imperative. You have got to understand the strengths and weaknesses of dyslexia so that you can advocate for your kids and so that you can give them the support that they need. There's, there's just no other way. If we're operating in myths, there's going to be trauma, you know, little t trauma, but it's still trauma to our kids, to their very, who they are. And number two is advocacy. You have got to be able to stand up and, and say, this is okay, this is not okay, this is what my kids need, and, and not stop until you get what you need. <laughs> Which I'm sure that Barb and all the people here are doing a great job with, but um, those are the two most important things. Get educated um, and advocate for your kids. And so I was gonna just pop up my question box here. Um, in fact, I could. Why don't we have people type in their questions, um, Marianne? Because you okay. could you could kind of see that. Um, this is so good. I know it's just oh, probably brought a lot to people's heads and minds. Oh, and I love what you shared because it's true. As parents, you know, we are the advocate for our kids, and we're mm -hmm. there to support them. And we need to not just look just at academics, but we need to look at the whole person, how they're doing with this and your whole family system and how it's going. And it's been such an unusual year. And especially as schools are starting to reopen again, you know, I know a lot of parents are asking that question. Do I send kids back to a hybrid? Cause we got our little routine going, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of questions going on that weren't going on three months ago. We were waiting for today, but now it's raising newer questions too. Um, so if you, I'm looking here, so, uh, Marianne, can you see the questions in the comment? Yes. See, I'm going to put my, my, website. Oh, good. There. Excellent. Thank um, you. You, I, you can also contact me through there if we don't get you. Yeah. So should I just, I'm going to start at the yeah. bottom. Maybe and Stephanie, one, can you speak to the positives of homeschooling for middle and high schoolers? Yes, I can. I'm glad that you asked. Um, so here's the thing with middle school and high school. So middle school kids, um, you know, they're transitioning out of that more concrete learning and they're becoming more abstract in their thinking. They're, if you have, have tweens and teens, young teens, they're argumentative, right? I call them little lawyers. Um, and so allowing them that voice and being able to um, um, debate um, to argue, to discuss, you know, structuring their curriculum in such a way that they have um, a voice and that they're able to um, debate. And, and, and so, for example, like a co-op that we were in, 
Um, Co-ops are fabulous for middle schoolers and they can be for high schoolers too, but this is where they have that peer kind of interaction where a good teacher will help them to discuss issues and debate them. This is um, something that is so important for them to develop critical thinking and autonomy to be able to, to reason. Cause you know, like your middle schoolers can come up with the most ridiculous things sometimes, you know, but if we give them practice with um, this uh, discussion, debate, talking about topics, um, homeschooling is a great opportunity to do that just in and of yourselves. And of course you could do that at home as well, but um, having some kind of um, uh, outlet for them for that is really good, but high school, so high school, again, the learning, um, the brain changes again in high school. And in high school, kids are more like, so they've learned the basics, you know, in elementary school, and they've learned to reason about it in middle school. And then in high school, they wanna kind of come up with their own unique, like this is who I am, right? They're becoming um, who they are, which is awesome, because that's what they're supposed to do. Um, but a lot of times in school, it's algebra, geometry, algebra two. It's physical science, uh, biology, chemistry. You know, we're, we're all on the same conveyor belt. It doesn't matter if you're into art and singing and sports, you're doing all, right? And so what the beauty of high school really is that you can tailor their education to their interests. Um, you don't, ha and, I, and I, I don't have a ton of experience with, the school themselves, like I have one, my non-dyslexic kid is in a private school that's really rigorous, but she just gobbles it up. So I, she's not really useful information for me. Um, but the high schoolers, um, being able to tailor their education to their interests is very powerful because you get buy-in from them. You know, you'll, I find with my kids, the more I march them through a traditional curriculum, boy, by the time they were juniors, they were so done with school. They, they were like, I don't want to learn any more history. I don't want to learn any more math, right? I don't need this for what I want to do. And it was, a, it was a difficult place for me to be because as a homeschooler, you have a lot of responsibility, right? And if you don't do the college prep, courses, then you're closing a door. And so, you know, as parents, we want to keep all the doors open. But what has come out of this for us is that my, um, you know, one of our kids, uh, she's graduating in May. Um, she went to community college first. So she didn't, you know, she, she was not a math kid, <laughs> although now she's a kinesiology major and has, has taken all kinds of math, right? But during high school, we chose, I chose to listen to them and to see, like, do you want to do more math? <laughs> you know, it was clear that she didn't. So she went. She went to community college. She started over with math, and she did fine. She did great. Um, yeah, it took her an extra semester. That's okay. Um, so I'm getting a little off track, but but really and truly, our kids can burn out in high school. Um, and, you know, my husband's education, I just wish we could get back to that. You know, I mentioned earlier that at 16, which is that burnout period, right? He was given an opportunity or a choice between college prep or an internship or an apprenticeship. Um, and so my non-dyslexic daughter and maybe my dyslexic daughter who's graduating may have chosen the college prep, right? And the other kids would have taken the uh, apprenticeship, um, but I think we should give our kids that option. I think we should give our kids an option to say, I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, because I'll tell you what, um, my most profoundly dyslexic son, uh, he's 23 now, um, that he didn't want to go to college. He took his college fund and invested it. He started a business and he is 23 and he's wildly successful. And you know why he is? Because he's a people person. And all through school, I kept saying, sit down, be quiet, stop, you know what I mean? And, and all along, that was, that. I mean, he's also has very high standards for work and so forth. And that gives us another character trait that you can develop at home, right? Anyway, so all that to say that you can really provide the unique learning environment that your older kids need um, so that they're not bored and getting into trouble, you know, and that kind of thing.
That's great. I've got a question that slipped in that kind of goes with this. Okay. Um, Heidi S. had sent this to Christine. It says, um, can you share more about what it means for your two older kids to be uniquely successful? And I think you just started talking about that. I wonder about my nine-year-old future, my nine-year-old's future. And, and I have to let you know, I have worried about all my kids' future, all of them. And that 23-year-old that I just mentioned, especially, because like I remember in high school, and it was five paragraph essay time. And, you know, one of the signs of dyslexia is not only tr difficulty spelling and writing, but getting the ideas out of your head onto paper. And so, you know, we'd make these mind maps and then he would, but then his sentence structures were poor. And it was like, I mean, I felt like I was writing the paper for him. I would be like, do this, now do that, now do this. <laughs> and I thought this kid is never going to be able to be successful, right? I, re I really believed that. And now I look back and kind of laugh at myself. Um, here's the big thing. It's motivation. So if a kid is doing something or a person is doing something that's of interest to them, then they're going to work really hard at it. So um, my 23 year old, so we're boating family. Um, my oldest son is the one who sailed around the world and he's a boat captain. Amazing. Yeah, I know. I, I don't talk about that all the time because then everyone wants to talk about that. Um, but he's a yacht captain and um, he does, yeah, he did a lot of yacht deliveries when he was younger. He really liked that adventure, but now he's just kind of an old man. He's 29. He's a full-time captain on a enormous yacht and he just takes this family out whenever they want to go out. <laughs> but my son, Toby, the 23-year-old, um, he worked with my husband for a few years. So that was kind of his apprenticeship. And then he had a vision for what he wanted to do. Like he saw, remember I told you like he was the kid at the homeschool conferences were like, this should be that way. And that should be this way. Well, he looked at the yachting industry and went, that's not, that's not the best way to do that. And this is a better way to do that. And he created a business, like a concierge kind of business for high-end clients um, and do you know, he types up proposals all the time and yeah. So like he'll, he'll create a whole business proposal for a client, like a million dollar thing. And, and he'll be like, mom, how do you change the printer ink? He doesn't live at home anymore, but he'll, he'll like, he doesn't need my help anymore. So the, <laughs> they do the, get there. <laughs> well, he, I mean, like he was typing a contract and I helped him with that, but, um, and sometimes I help him like if he's writing an important email and he wants it to make sense because his brain is kind of like this way, like 3 3d and the 2d stuff. Sometimes he wants help with feedback. So I don't know if that answers your question, but he found something that was interesting to him. He had a vision for what it was going to look like and he went out and made it happen. Um, and my husband is the same way. You know, he was a little bit different. He finished his apprenticeship and he would buy old boats and flip them. So you know how people flip houses? He would flip boats. Um, that was his way where he made money when he was younger. So um, yeah, so that's, this is what I'm talking about. Like when, and you see all the time, like dyslexic people who have multiple degrees and that, you know, doing very well, like academically. And it's because they're passionate about what they're doing. My daughter, who's just graduating with kinesiology um, barely got through algebra in high school. I hired a tutor and I was like, she would come out of her room and she'd be like, I don't want to go. And I was, <laughs> and I was like, you get in that car and you go to that tutor or you're paying for it. And she'd be like, Oh, you know, I mean, that's what our, our, our math experience was. And then now, you know, she got to college and she was like, I need to get good grades. Right. And so she just motivated herself and it's a beautiful thing. So kind of, you know, I like to be able to give parents that perspective. Um, your nine-year-old is fine. You know, your nine-year-old, you love them and you point out their strengths and you encourage them and, and do those, those, you know, encourage those success attributes um, and they'll be fine. Right. Awesome. We got a, a uh, um, something here from Jessica Burkholder. She said, um, I'm always struggling with the idea of if a day isn't going well, nothing's going in, like you said, mm -hmm. just go do something else like play hike, etc. Sometimes I feel like we would just spend every day hiking and never work on literacy and math skills. Wow. How important is repetition for dyslexic learners? 
And how do you balance staying on track with the basics and making space for tough days? That is, that's a great question. Yeah. And so, um, so I am not an unschooler, but I have been doing a lot of research, research on it recently. In fact, um, I'm going to be interviewing, I don't know if you guys know uh, Gina Riley. She's out of New York, um, but she's done a ton of work with uh, Peter Gray, who is a math, who is like the father of unschooling. But essentially the idea is, is that, you know, our kids are always learning and, um, schools have kind of compartmentalized it and made it linear and orderly, which is important because otherwise, you know, how are we going to organize all these kids? But as homeschoolers, um, learning can be kind of like a step forward, two step back, three steps forward, one step back. It's very all over the place sometimes. So first of all, I would, I would, (laughs) if you find yourself hiking a lot, maybe you have a wiggly kid who needs to move a lot you know, maybe um, bring, uh, you know, record something on your phone, you know, and sing um, multiplication songs while you're hiking, right? Or, um, you know, if you have an app that you're using to learn sounds or something, you know, your phonemes and your, and stuff, you could use something like that while you're hiking or in the car. A lot of times when we're driving somewhere, we do learning, you know, I'll put in, uh, we were in a co-op where they had a lot of memory. They would memorize like the world history events, you know, to song. And so we would listen to those kinds of things in the car. Um, Repetition is really important for dyslexic learners, but like when nothing's going in, it doesn't matter how much you make it, try to make it go in. Um, And uh, like, this is going to be a unique to you, Jessica, and and you're going to get it wrong sometimes. You know, you might decide, I'm not going to work on math facts over the summer. I am so done working on math facts, right? Um, and then you may find in the school year that they, they have forgotten them. But um, Can I chime would, in a little bit there, Miriam? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I find um, I'm an educational therapist, so I work with kids um, one-on-one. And, you know, you kind of have those days, like they were getting it yesterday, but not today. And um, just part of that dyslexia awareness, Marianne was talking about, I tell kids, you know, this is part of dyslexia. Yeah. You know, that sometimes we just have those days where our brain just isn't connecting as well. Then of course we always t- want to normalize it so they don't feel like yeah. weird. And I'll say, you know, I get that way when I'm tired. I don't, I don't know if your mom gets that way too. You know, when I'm tired, my brain's just not firing well. And, um, you know, so we're going to review a lot today. So, so what I think pedagogically is I back up and I'm thinking, I'm not introducing something new today because it's not going to stick. (laughs) So, so it's a great day to review and practice because research shows like a non-dyslexic learner can learn things in eight to 10 repetitions and a student with dyslexia or any kind of learning disability, it's 20 to 40 plus. Mm -hmm. And I, I cannot tell you how many students or how many parents, when they learn that say to me, Oh, my kids more like a hundred. And, um, I've met those kids and they are more like a hundred. So, you know, we just need to, you know, that's part of it. And, but I also think it's a good place to, to, for self-awareness of the kids that, okay, if you're having one of those days, we just kind of give our, tutor ourselves a little kinder. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe it's not the day to give that test. Maybe you could give it tomorrow if you could, or maybe today or this morning they're that way, but they may be better this afternoon. It could be time of day kind of thing to give them some power food and see if that Mm -hmm. makes a difference and those kinds of things. Yeah. I I also have, I have resources for those days, you know, so it'll be games. Um, I I've accumulated quite a few, um, you know, reading games over the years from teachers pay teachers. Um, and so sometimes we'll just play games. Um, when my kids were really young, we'd watch, what is that? The leapfrog videos, those were so good <laughs> when your kids are young. I'm pretty sure my younger kids learned all their letter sounds and numbers and days of the week from. Well, leapfrog. somebody asked a question along that line, Marianne. Um, Amanda asked, can you share some tips for helping kids memorize facts? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it looks like math facts um, and yeah. equations. Mm-hmm. So math facts. Um, so for, for addition, there's some tricks you know, like nine sucks up one to make it 10. So if you're adding to nine and, and eight sucks up two to make 10. And um, there's, um, but really addition, you know, you just have to kind of learn. And I think kids 
kids do learn those in large part, you know, there's a resource that I really liked. I don't know if you mind me sharing it. I mean, I don't own no, it. We're good for resources. So it's, I love called, it. it's called Math It. And it's kind of old. Like, I think, I think you can find it still. Um, but what it is, is this, it's like a cardboard board and it comes with these little cardboard tabs and it has the addition fact on it. So like all the, um, and they're, so there's, they're different, they're color coded. I can't remember the addition one now, but um, it's just multi-sensory, like they're not writing. Um, and so they'll say two plus two um, and they'll lay it on the four, you know? And so, and, and then they, it, he gives little tips for remembering them. And then there's also a math, a multiplication one um, that's very good. And he has one called um, double it where he teaches you how to do mental math and double a number in your head. Mm -hmm. um, but that was very, very helpful for my kids to be able to move and touch and say and put things down. Um, but multiplication for us um, singing a song has been, I mean, I'm, I'm, pretty sure my kids were in high school and they were still singing these songs, you know. Um, we would work so hard on learning them, honestly, and they would not remember them. That I, so, so what, what I've done, like a lot of parents will say to me, um, you know, well, I can't move ahead in math because they don't know their math facts. No, 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 no. We don't want to do that because they're intellectually able to understand the math. So at a certain point where if they can't move forward, then I give them a math facts chart, a multiplication chart, and they don't want to look it up either. But it's also a source of remediation because if you're looking up six times six, you know how they, they you draw the, your fingers together, um, 50 times, you know, you're going to start to remember that six times six is 36 because you're doing it so many times. And so I kind of look at it as an um, accommodation, but also a remediation to help them, you know, with especially not having to ask you. Um, so yeah, and I, that, I, I totally agree. I think with the older kids for multiplication tables, um, that's a great accommodation. I think, you know, there, there are plenty of songs out there or, or kids make yeah. them up themselves. That's a fun family project. Um, for elementary, I think too, if they have a really good handle of the number line and how numbers relate to each other, and then you teach them the tricks, like, you know, the plus one tricks, you know, and the yeah. doubles and, and the zero trick. And, you yeah. know, there are certain foundational ones. If they can get those and really see where things fit on a number line, they can visualize it. And I totally agree with you on multi-sensory, you know, if they have things to manipulate, yeah. saying it, seeing it, doing okay. it at the same time really helps those synapses to connect. Yeah. 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 Um, and then as far as high school goes, what I have done with my kids is made them like a cheat sheet. Um, and you can find them online, but they, you really are just better off to make your own and just whatever they're working on at that time, they have, you know, the, the, the procedure written down next to them really clearly, maybe even color coded if that's something that helps them. But um, again, you know, what's the purpose? You know, the purpose isn't necessarily to memorize the formula. We don't need to memorize much these days, you know, with technology, but the, to be able to use the formula. Um, so I would say just make them a cheat sheet for high school. I think you think of, we use those for a lot of different things. Um, you know, you might have a post-it on your computer that lists the things you need to do to get yeah. into a thing. And, you know, we need, that's a great strategy for kids to know. We carry that into adulthood as well. Yeah. Marian, on those OG programs you mentioned, Cynthia was asking, um, could you re-articulate yeah. those four? Yes. Um, so there's Barton, uh, Barton Reading. There's All About Reading, mm -hmm. which I like because they separate out spelling you know how spelling, well, you know this, Barb, like spelling is so slow to develop that you can move ahead with reading, but then do start later with the spelling. Um, and it's a nice review. Um, so there's all about reading and all about spelling. Logic of English, I particularly like. Um, they are, it has a lot more multi-sensory kind of activities in it. She is trained in, um, or in Gillingham, Linda Mubel, 
I think NLD. She's re trained in a lot of different things, um, and it's colorful. It's nice. And what's um, the name of it again? It's Logic of English. Logic of English. Mm -hmm. And then for older kids, if you have an older kid who's struggling, um, and I know a lot of the schools use this for their IEP kids, but it's called uh, Reading Horizons Elevate, and it would be the at-home version. So they do. They've been creating Orton Gillingham programs for schools for like 30 years. But they're, I don't really recommend their younger kids program because I feel like younger kids need face-to-face. -face. Um, but the um, Elevate program for kids, I think it's 10 and up. It's good for adults. Um, I have a review for, uh, um, of it on my site. It's called Help for the Older Struggling Reader. Um, so it kind of walks you through what they have, but they have, it's a very systematic Orton Gillingham program. They, it's really straightforward, no butterflies or puppies, right? So it's good for older kids, it has um, vocabulary. It has um, like a library that opens up. So the farther you go, you know, the more things open up for you to read. And it's, it's like blog posts or magazine articles. So it looks um, good. So I've used that for a lot of my older kids, like, maybe 14, 13, 14, even 15, um, because their reading may be clicking, but the spelling's kind of lagging. And so I find that when they kind of look at it one more time, it's a push all the way through, um, you know, that it really helps them solidify those skills. And it's, um, what's nice about it is it's one program. Uh, the other programs I mentioned all have levels. Mm -hmm. So you'd, you know, go through the levels, but um, reading horizons. That's great. Yeah. I, can, I, can I, do you want to mention like OG structured literacy, what that means for people who aren't aware? Sure. Sure. So Orton Gillingham is just, um, an, really an approach to teaching that works really well with kids with dyslexia. Um, and it's, um, different from other reading programs because it's very systematic. Um, everything is taught the same way. It's taught bit by bit, just tiny little step by tiny little step. Um, and it builds on itself in a natural progression. Nothing's assumed. Everything's taught. Um, it's multi-sensory. So a lot of these programs are going to come with, you know, reading t little t letter tiles um, that you're going to pull down to spell and work on um, down. So it's, it's more multi-sensory. It's more... Um, I don't know if I'm doing it justice. I'm not. No, you are. It. But it's, okay. it's structured. It's systematic. Yeah. It loops a lot. You teach yeah. something, you go back and you review it. Mm -hmm. um, but for what people to know is the term um, OG based curriculum. We've been using that term for a long time. And about two years ago, um, maybe about three years ago, people started using structured literacy, yeah. which kind of means the same. It means the same oh, thing. So yeah, yeah. the research out there. Um, for dyslexic kids is that you want a, an Orton Gillingham based program. So if you're looking for somebody to do remediation, you just always ask, what's your training? And if they're trained in or an OG based or structured literacy program, they will tell you. Yeah. If, they're, if they don't mention it, keep looking. Because um, you can, there can be some really nice tutors out there, but you want somebody for your dyslexic kid trained in the program that works for dyslexics and all oh, children, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, so you might, they might be using the word structured literacy, which is kind of what OG based has okay. evolved yeah. into this term as okay. well. Mm -hmm. um, and then for you to note, um, as we kind of start to wrap up and we'll go into some extended time here if people are available. Um, well, let me just mention that. Um, we're we're going to hang out for another half an hour if people want to hang out and have questions. Um, but let's take a minute and let's thank Marianne. This was absolutely wonderful, Marianne. Um, beyond what we hope for. Um, you're articulate and just passionate about kids and giving us a good perspective as parents um, on how to work with our kids. Um, for you guys to know about um, IDA, we do um, training programs in the summer for teachers and also parents can take them. Um, this summer we have Orton, two Orton Gillingham programs. Um, I think both are going to be online. Um, we did that like last summer as well. You, they're usually face to face, but the last year we did it online that worked well. We'll also be offering the Wilson program, which is a really good structured literacy or in Gillingham based program. And then we're also, for the first time this summer, offering um, Step Up to Writing, which is a not Step Up to Writing, wrong program. Um, 
boy, my mind just went blank and I've got the book right here. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, framing your thoughts. Thank you. Oh, I, you know, I was thinking it last summer and I just love this curriculum. Um, framing your thoughts. It's, it's um, from Language Circle. Um, it's a writing for um, sentences and paragraphs. So we'll be having training in that this summer. So we've got a lot of trainings coming. I think it'll be up on the website later this month. And then as I mentioned earlier about grants, we will have a couple more parent groups this spring. We're still setting those up. So you can, um, if you are not on a mailing list, just um, contact Christy at info at dyslexialla.org and, um, or just mention it here in the chat and Christy will pick it up and make sure we get you on your website or on our mailing list. Um, I think actually by being here today, you are officially now on our way mailing list and you can always unsubscribe. So we will have some more coming and um, we're gonna hang out till 1130. So if anybody wants to hang out and ask more questions,